Thank you. The next item of business is a debate on programme for government 2024 to 2025. I'd be grateful if members who wish to speak in the debate were to press their request to speak buttons. And I now call on Douglas Ross up to 11 minutes, please. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Today we've seen the publication of the final report into the appalling tragedy that saw 72 people die in Grenfell Tower seven years ago. The inquiry chair, Sir Martin Moorbeck, said that the residents were badly let down by organisations that should have protected them. And the report found that the fire at Grenfell Tower was a culmination of decades of failure by central government and other bodies in positions of responsibility. We all have a responsibility to learn from the lessons of this tragedy and ensure that it can never happen again. The First Minister said in his statement that he would be looking at the report and I hope his government will give a very early opportunity for members to debate and discuss that report here and how the 58 recommendations will be implemented should they affect uh, us here in Scotland and also to provide an update on the cladding remediation programme here in Scotland. Presiding officer, in responding to this year's programme for government, we cannot ignore the fiscal context in which the SNP Scottish Government has found itself in. Yes, there are pressures brought in by the new Labour government, a government which, within weeks of taking office, stripped millions of pensioners of their winter fuel payment, a shameful decision that is being replicated by this SNP Scottish Government uh, here at Holyrood. But the nationalists really only have themselves to blame for the mess that they find themselves in. Yesterday, the Finance Secretary said that all members of Parliament must face up to the challenge. But it's SNP ministers and SNP MSPs that need to follow her advice. Even their own budget forecaster has said that, and I quote, much of the pressure comes from the Scottish Government's own decisions. There's no one left to blame. There's nowhere left to hide. What we got yesterday, and in the programme for government today, are SNP choices. And what we got yesterday was SNP cuts that will have an impact on delivering the programme for government. So let's just remember where these cuts were. Yesterday, we had cut to the economy budget, a budget held by the Deputy First Minister, but she's accepting her budget will be cut. The justice budget, cut. Rural affairs budget, cut. Transport budget, cut. Education and skills budget, cut. Health and social care budget, cut. It seems the only area that was protected was, was Angus Robertson's portfolio, the constitution. The money the SNP government used to promote independence is more important to them than the vital public services that the people of Scotland expect to be delivered by this government. For years, the SNP government has patted itself on the back for their policies and decisions. But now the public can see that they are paying the price for these SNP choices. The SNP have also, for years, praised themselves at running a balanced budget. Let that claim never be uttered in this chamber again. They have lost control of the budget here in Scotland. They are filling the gap time after time. And I, I will give way in a moment to the Deputy First Minister. But let us be very clear. It is decisions and choices they have made that have led to a huge black hole in the Scottish Government's budget. I'll give way to the Deputy First Minister. Deputy First Minister. Can the member confirm that the Scottish Government, by law, is not allowed to overspend its budget? And can it name one year in the last 17 where the Scottish Government has overspent its budget? Douglas Well, if, if they hadn't overspent their budget, they wouldn't be pulling in hundreds of millions of pounds from the Scotland budget. You know, that money is coming in to fill the gaps they have created in their own budget. Choices by SNP ministers, year after year, are having an impact. They also promised that if we pay more in taxes in Scotland, that would fund better public services. Yet instead, the government is cutting from almost every department that delivers these public services. With the SNP, you pay more and you get less. Now, time and time again, Scottish Conservatives have warned against these raising taxes and the impact it would have for people and businesses across Scotland and our economy, and it was ignored. And what we are getting now 
is because of this financial mismanagement, a threadbare programme for a government which has been published today. This was John Swinney's big moment. This was his chance to reset the SNP government after 17 years, to boldly launch his premiership as First Minister. Has he really been waiting 25 years to deliver that speech we have just listened to? Because what we got was a programme of tardo promises that should have been delivered years ago. In so many areas, we see any suggestion of bold action watered down or abandoned in favour of restating existing commitments. The First Minister is basically trying to make it impossible for his government to fail by promising nothing. Yeah. Under John Swinney, the SNP are admitting that the SNP are out of ideas and out of ambition mm -hmm. for Scotland. Yeah. Yeah. Let's just look at some of the proposals that we've heard today. And you know, on eradicating child poverty, we all want to see that. We all want to do that. And the First Minister is just coming up, and I know what he's going to ask about. But why is it taking 17 years? He's been in government for 16 of those years. Why now, in 2024, is eradicating child poverty finally a priority for this government? And will he accept, as I'm about to allow his intervention, will he accept that child poverty has gone up since the SNP came to power in 2007? First Minister. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to Mr Ross for giving way. And I point out to Mr Ross that the government of which uh, I have been a member, although I, I had a year out of government, uh, the, year, the government I have been a member of introduced the Scottish Child Payment, the boldest and biggest intervention yeah. to tackle, tackle child poverty in Europe since the 1980s. And the reason why we had to do that was because child poverty was spiralling because of the austerity that Douglas Ross voted yeah. for in the House of Commons when he was there. And now, and, now, and now child poverty in Scotland is significantly lower than yeah. the rest of the United Kingdom because of... Because, well, it's higher than when we came to office Briefly. because of Tory austerity. That's why, we're, that's why it's higher. And finally, what position is Douglas Ross in to lecture me about child poverty when he voted for the two-child cap and is proud D of it? Douglas Ross. John Swinney speaks about legislation he introduced and the governments he was part of introduced. What about the legislation in 2017 that set the target for reducing child poverty? Those targets have failed to be met. They are not going to be met because the SNP's government of Scotland has seen child poverty increase rather than go downwards or be uh, eradicated. Uh, some, some other issues, some other, some other issues that are uh, in this um, programme for government, which, which are uh, important. You know, the NHS it is crucial that we focus on our NHS because every single one of us will have cases, they are articulated on a weekly basis here in the Scottish Parliament, of patient suffering. But we didn't get any proper uh, new information from the First Minister or the Government today. It's going to be more of the same. They're going to deliver these changes despite a huge cut to the, SNP bud uh, to the NHS budget announced yesterday. I don't think any patient or family of a patient watching this programme for government today will take any comfort from what they heard uh, from John Swinney. Uh, we did uh, certainly welcome his proposals to change ministerial investigations. I wonder if it's belatedly uh, a recognition from John Swinney that he got it wrong over supporting his friend Michael Matheson. That shameful episode brought shame not just on John Swinney as a person, but the office of First Minister. And I wonder if that is the reason he has decided to allow uh, the independent ministerial adviser uh, on the Code of Conduct to be involved. Because clearly, John Swinney got it wrong. He, he got it wrong backing his friend rather than doing the right thing for the people uh, of Scotland. Now, there's, there's an awful lot being chuntered from the front bench. Yes. What has not been said in 30 minutes of the, Deputy, uh, the First Minister's speech was a single mention of drugs or alcohol. Yeah. That did not Change. register once. Not a single mention. It is not a priority for John Swinney or this SNP government. Yeah. Just a month after, we heard that in 2023, 1,172 people in Scotland died from drugs, an increase of 121 from the year before. 
If that is going to be a priority, a defining mission of his government to end these deaths, they don't even get a mention. Really, that is shameful from this SNP government that took its eye off the ball with drug and alcohol deaths and is still doing it by ignoring the situation as it is right now. Presiding officer, this programme for government is yet another wasted opportunity from this SNP government and there are not many left for them. Because as well as things being included in this programme for government, there are other things that have been excluded. There was one small reference to the A9. Where was the commitment to fully dual the A96 from Inverness to Aberdeen? So the First Minister has had a lot to say and I'll take his intervention. Does his government still support the dueling of the A96 from Inverness to Aberdeen and when will that crucial road be fully dueled? First Minister. Nothing to say. Nothing. Nothing to say. Nothing. Nothing. He had plenty to say a minute ago. Really? A crucial link between two of Scotland's biggest cities, Inverness to Aberdeen, going through communities that have been promised a full upgrade and a duelling of that road for decades by the SNP. Not a single word in the programme for government and now not a single word from the First Minister. The communities of the North East can see they are not a priority for this SNP First Minister. Presiding officer, this is uh, an opportunity and this would have been a uh, an opportunity. Sorry, I thought someone wanted to intervene. But they're just uh, wondering why their First Minister had nothing to say about it. Yeah. Yeah. This could have been an opportunity to focus on education, on health, about improving public services, but instead we got more of the same. The same failings, the same incompetence, the same focus on the wrong priorities. Do I have time to take an intervention? No. I'm sorry, I'm sure we'll hear from Keith Brown later. This is the same feelings, the same incompetence and the same focus on the wrong priorities. This was the time to change gear, to turn things around and actually focus on the priorities of the Scottish public. Yet instead we have continuity from a First Minister who is the embodiment of continuity. continuity. The SNP have already lost control of public finances. They will soon lose control of the Scottish Government. They have let the people of Scotland down and they deserve to pay the price for it. Thank you. I can advise the Chamber we do have no time in hand and therefore uh, any interventions will have to be accommodated in the Time Alliance. And I call Anna Sarwar up to eight minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I start by acknowledging the powerful and important inquiry report on Grenfell Tower today? A, a absolute tragedy and all those families that lost loved ones. And we all have a duty to stand with those families in their demand for justice, uh, families that were ultimately failed. And I hope at some point we will have a response from government at the appropriate time about what lessons there are to be learned for us here in Scotland. Presiding officer, we were promised that this was meant to be the great relaunch. We were promised a new focus, a new direction, a new plan. But instead we have more of the same, the same sticky plaster approach, the same rehashed announcements and the same level of denial from the third First Minister in three years. Scotland needed a programme for government that recognised the scale of the challenge facing our country. Stagnating growth, record long NHS waiting lists, education standards falling, rising levels of drug deaths not even mentioned by the First Minister when it's supposed to be a priority for this government. A housing emergency, but instead we have an SNP government with no vision, no strategy and no plan. And that's why it's getting clearer by the day that Scotland needs change. All the signs are that the SNP are just simply running down the clock on the last 18 months of this parliament. Year after year, programme for government after programme for government, we see the same pattern. Long lists of pledges are made, a lot of which are well-intentioned and well-meaning, but it's immediately after the headlines have been grabbed that things start to fall apart. Many of the promises made by SNP First Ministers in these speeches simply never see the light of day. And for those that do, they are so often haphazard and incompetent in their implementation that it actually undermines the intentions of this Parliament and what people across the country want and demand. Worse still, I'm happy to take an intervention. Deputy First Minister. I just wondered if Labour's definition of change of things like promising energy bills being reduced by £300 but going up by 10% was really the kind of change that Scotland wants. 
Anna Sarwar. I'm, I'm, I'm glad the Deputy First Minister, who is meant to be the change candidate but actually never stood in the end, uh, wants to try and blame a government that's been in power for eight weeks rather than take responsibility for a government that's been in power for 17 years. So worse still, many plans pile yet more pressure on Scotland's public services and leave working people paying more and getting less. I've just started my contribution, but we can break through this managed decline and demonstrate that we can have effective government here in Scotland that delivers for the Scottish people. And that's why, unlike the gloom of John Swinney and Shona Robertson, I am actually optimistic for the future of this country and believe Scotland's best days lie ahead of it. But it requires a Mr. government Sauer, that is honest. Seat. I've allowed a bit of leeway for reaction to comment, but the ongoing bruha, particularly from the front benches, let it be uh, said, is unacceptable. We will listen uh, with some respect to the person who has the floor, and at the moment that's Anna Sauer. Anna Sauer. Well, President Officer, they said they were going to learn the lessons from the verdict of the Scottish people. Clearly, they aren't learning the lessons of the verdict of the Scottish people. But it requires, but it requires a government that is honest. The, the First Minister had 30 minutes to speak and a barely in to three minutes. But it requires a government that is honest about the scale of the challenge it faces and focuses on tackling them. That is the test this programme for government needed to pass, but it has failed. We need a government that gets on with the job of reversing the damage done by this SNP government, a party that has lost its way, is incompetent in government and is bad with people's money. The First Minister leads an administration that raises revenue, that can grow the economy and can make laws here in Scotland. It has control of our NHS, our schools, housing, justice and more. But more often than not, and we've heard it again today, they would rather talk about what they can't do rather than what they can do always making excuses and always somebody else to blame. And frankly, as the election in July showed, Scots are sick of it. We need to build an NHS fit for the future and there when people need it. So we can have a genuine catch-up plan and clear the backlog that now sits at 864,366 Scots. That's one in six Scots on an NHS waiting list and those numbers continue to grow. It's the same story across the NHS. Brave staff trying to deliver services in impossible circumstances, all while this government ignores the problem. The number of operations being scheduled remains well below pre-pandemic levels. There are still over 3,000 nursing and midwifery vacancies. Delayed discharge rates continue to rise, but despite this, nothing in this programme for government will tackle the record-long waits in our NHS and get our healthcare system working for patients again. The First Minister declared that this was a programme for government for Scotland's children. But it's clear this incompetent government, yet again, has no plan for Scotland's young people. Just yesterday, his government cut mental health support to young people. Nearly one in six children and young people who need support with mental health are forced to wait more than four months to get help. And shamefully, one in four children asking for help with a mental health crisis are turned away. Families abandoned by the SNP government and his plan does nothing to help them. And it's the same story in education. The SNP has broken its promise on the attainment gap, with results showing it's widening on John Swinney's watch. And let's not forget, this is the same man who attempted to downgrade the grades of working class kids during the pandemic. And on his watch, Scotland fail is failing in the international, falling in the international league tables. And for all the talk of teacher numbers, over 400 teacher posts being cut in Glasgow alone, all while violence in our schools is on the rise. But despite that, nothing in this programme will get to grips with the crisis in Scotland's schools. And in the past 12 months, we have seen record levels of drug deaths in this country and nothing in this programme for government to attempt to deal with that crisis. Scotland's housing crisis is getting worse. Hard-working Scots looking to buy their first home priced out of the market and too many struggling to make ends meet while rents rise and rise. A shocking 10,000 children in temporary accommodation without a home to call their own. And across Scotland, communities are left feeling unsafe because our justice system is broken too on their watch and we have a crumbling police estate and a huge court backlog. Again, nothing in this programme for government to address that. So this programme for government is not up to the scale of the challenges facing Scotland, but change is possible. 
in 2026, we can elect a government that is optimistic and positive about the future for Scotland. A government about service, not party. A government about delivering for the people of Scotland, not seeing politics as a game. A government of decency, integrity and honesty, not defending our pals. A First Minister who wants to announce a change to the Ministerial Code today, but forgets his own behaviour in the Alex Salmond inquiry or indeed the Michael Matheson scandal. A government that gets on with strengthening and reforming our institutions in Scotland, left weaker after 17 years of SNP government. A government that wants to change our country for the better and realise the hopes and aspirations of the people of Scotland. A government of service for Scotland. A government that will reform our NHS and make it fit for the future. A government that will get our education system back on track and make it once again the envy of the world. A government that will partner with business to jumpstart economic growth and deliver prosperity for Scotland. A government that will take head on the housing emergency and realise the dream of home ownership ownership, a government that delivers change. Scotland needs change. It's sick of this failing SNP government and Scottish Labour is ready to deliver it. Thank you. I now call Lorna Slater. Up to five minutes, Ms Slater. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I wish to associate myself with colleagues' remarks around the tragedy at the Grenfell Tower. Today's programme for government is billed as prioritising future generations, but the decisions made this week by the Scottish Government do exactly the opposite. We cannot take today's programme for government on its own without looking at the context of yesterday's fiscal update. The slashing of public spending, particularly on our journey to net zero, is selling out the future of our young people. The suggestion that we can continue with business as usual to deliver all the same things whilst spending less money is quite frankly delusional. Some clarity about what the Scottish Government will not be able to deliver would be welcome. The Scottish Greens support the First Minister's vision to eradicate child poverty, but the shelving of plans to roll out free school meals for all primary school children, as it appears to be set out in today's programme for government, will make that worse, not better. In addition to funding and programmes, ensuring our children have a future worth living, a future full of opportunity and hope, also requires us to make the tough decisions that are now required to prevent catastrophic climate breakdown. You can't grow a green economy without substantial investment. And more of this investment needs to come from the private sector. That's exactly what the Scotwind funding was. This was supposed to be our green sovereign wealth fund to invest in solutions like the climate and nature emergencies, like community-owned renewables and training the next generation of engineers. What we saw yesterday was the Scottish Government emptying the pot, spending the last remaining Scotland funding whilst slashing net zero investment and continuing to give handouts to big business. On the planned Climate Change Targets Bill, the Scottish Greens have reluctantly accepted that whilst the 2030 net zero target is now out of reach, it is due to 15 years during which time governments fixated on targets whilst failing to make the big changes needed to actually drive down emissions. The Scottish Greens can only support a change to climate targets if it is accompanied by a significant ramping up of action, a climate reset, where we finally stop building new roads and new fossil fuel power stations, where we put climate change at the top of the political and public agenda, where we significantly ramp up the decarbonisation of our homes and public buildings. I am also deeply concerned by the failure to include a bill to ban conversion practices in the legislative programme. This bill started out as a petition to this parliament over four years ago 
from campaigners whose lives had been impacted by the trauma of so-called conversion therapy. The Human Rights and Equalities Committee concluded over two years ago that Scotland-specific legislation be brought forward as soon as possible. And while the Scottish Greens would wholly welcome an eventual UK-wide ban, we in Scotland have the mandate to deliver a watertight ban now, which will end this cruel and inhumane torture that is going on behind closed doors in Scotland. The Scottish Government should confirm when they will press the button on this draft legislation, and it must ensure that we have legislation in place before the next election. Now is the time to show boldness, not to cower to the reactionary forces of the right. This is the first program for government in four years, which the Scottish Greens did not co-design. And quite frankly, it shows. Continuing to hand out tax breaks to private companies whilst scrapping free bus travel for asylum seekers is not something the Scottish Greens would ever have agreed to. Emptying out our Green Sovereign Wealth Fund whilst cutting overall funding for net zero by £23 million is a betrayal of future generations and abandoning our responsibility to tackle the climate emergency. Shelving vital legislation on equalities and human rights cannot be blamed on budget cuts and can only be put down to cowardice from the SNP government. We have 18 months left of this session of Parliament to build a fairer and greener Scotland, which leaves our society you need and to our conclude. planet in a better shape for future generations. The SNP may have given up on that mission, but the Scottish Greens never will. Thank you. I now call Alex Cole Hamilton up to five minutes. Mr Cole Hamilton. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Presiding Officer. Uh, this Parliament uh, reconvenes this week for the first time since the UK general election. And that was an election that in many ways the public, the people of Scotland, the people we are here to serve, rendered their judgment on the focus and the priorities of the SNP government. It was a brutal night for the SNP, but it was a historic night for the Liberal Democrats. It saw us overtake the Con Scottish Conservative Party, come within touching distance in terms of Scottish MPs returned to Westminster of the Scottish National Party, and viewed from space, we now represent more geographical territory north of the border than even the Scottish Labour Party. People place their trust in us, and we will repay that trust in full. As we return to this chamber, presiding officer, we are faced with the brutal spending cuts which are set to cause untold damage and pain to public services and households across Scotland. They will define the remainder of this parliament. Some of that pain is the residual legacy of the damage, the economic damage caused by the Conservative government. But that doesn't tell the whole story. Much of the pressure comes from the Scottish government's own decisions, such is the judgment of the Scottish Fiscal Commission, and it paints a bleak picture of this government's management of our finances. Presiding officer, it's not hard to see how we got here. The Scottish government has played fast and loose with the Scottish people's money and squandered so much of our potential. A billion pound ministeri ministerial takeover of social care that will strip power away from our communities. Ferries that are millions upon millions of pounds over budget and years overdue. And Scotland's precious seabed sold off on the cheap. Presiding officer, there was a time when the First Minister's predecessor, of whom we seldom speak, called Scotland's renewable potential the Saudi Arabia of the North. This also from a party which attacked Margaret Thatcher for decades for failing to set up a sovereign wealth fund for the oil beneath our seabed. Yesterday, the SNB destroyed any chance of such a long-term fund being established from the wind farms now being built upon it. It's Scotland's wind, presiding officer, but the SNP have blown it. The government still haven't been entirely clear, but it now looks as though all of that, all of that one-off revenue is fully committed. In which case, yesterday's announcement may plug half of the hole they have created in our national finances, but the question remains, what on earth plugs that gap next year? Presiding officer, the SNP claim to be stronger for Scotland, but the facts do not bear that out. 
In this programme for government, there has been no mention of drug deaths still at record heights, of reducing teacher contact time or in, in, uh, recruiting 3.5 thousand teachers or assistants. No mention of that at all. No reassurance on culture. And I think most criminally, what we are hearing with a, a £19 million pound cut to mental health is the fact that already, even though the First Minister has reset the target to clear down child and adolescent mental health waiting times, by December 2025, that is a new target because they missed the original one of March 2023. The First Minister likes to talk about conducting politics in a more grown-up fashion. Well, in grown-up politics, you have to listen to what the country is telling you. The SNP were humbled at the ballot box, and people are speaking. It is now self-evident that his party is incapable of listening. The country is tired. It's tired of feeling like nothing works anymore, of working harder, of falling further behind. Well, as we debate the priorities of this government for this parliamentary year ahead, let me spell out the messages that we have heard door by door and street by street from the people of this country. We need to fix our health services with fast access to GPs, dentists and mental health services, to deliver world-beating education and a green jobs revolution to get our economy growing again, insulate homes so that the pensioners who are having their winter fuel payments removed by the Labour government have a chance of staying warm this winter. That's what the Liberal Democrats want to do, to fight for a fair deal for carers, the thousands of people with long COVID who this government has ignored for years, support small businesses, protect local authority funding and stop sewage being dumped in our rivers. Infighting in the Scottish National Party has sucked focus and dedication away from the central mission of public service that should divine any government of any stripe. They remain divided, but Scotland has signalled that it wants to move on from that division. A house divided cannot stand. In 20 months' time, there will be young people casting their votes for the first time who have only ever known SNP rule. It is well past time that they knew a Scotland not weighed down or held back by a government so out of touch. Thank you. We now move to the open debate. I call first uh, Michelle Thompson to be followed by Liz Smith. Up to four minutes. Ms Thompson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Now, I'm sure the First Minister wishes that we, like Independent Ireland, had the issue of how to spend a surplus of around €8.6 billion. Euros. Little Ireland, disdained by the UK commentariat after some property exuberance pre-credit crunch, has come back with bigger tiger teeth. Taking the opportunity to replace the UK as a gateway to Europe, pitching well above its weight in the world, it's unique in wrestling with our surplus challenge. Meanwhile, the UK economy, one of the hardest hit of all the large advanced economies and the slowest to recover from the credit crunch, was economically badly prepared for the COVID pandemic and has struggled since. No optimism can be seen from the new UK Labour government. They have adopted the Tory fiscal rules, rules which are made up anyway and underpin the fact that austerity is a policy choice. They fully embrace the idiocy of Brexit. And the only thing we can be certain of, contrary to when Labour will last in power and told things can only get better, is that things will absolutely get much worse. Never forget, this is the backdrop in which we are required to operate in Scotland, where we must be grateful for the capital expenditure crumbs that see a 20% reduction in monies available to invest and grow our economy, and where the revenue budget has not taken account of the height of CPI inflation at 18.9% over the past few years. So what of today's programme for government? I'm very aware it's been drawn together in the most difficult of times. The UK budget won't be till the end of October and the final amount available for the Scottish Government not known until February 2025. So I celebrate what I have heard today in it. And I'm pleased to see that it targets key areas rather than the broad brush approach adopted previously. And I'm especially pleased to see its focus on economic growth. Now, a couple of points. I welcome, of course, the signing of the Falkirk Growth Deal, the focus on a just transition for Grangemouth, and that the resources will now be made available to allow Creative Scotland to open the open fund. And I also note the investment in tech scale is very important. 
However, what is most pleasing to me is the £600 million in affordable housing and a further £100 million for mid-market rent homes. And I note with interest the comments around Stage 2 of the Housing Bill that sounds optimistic in recognising the need for developers to have a clear line of sight over future margins and a return on investment. So I really welcome that. So lastly, to return to Ireland, their intention is not to spend their surplus. They plan to save for the future. And on that, I will again gently express my concern at the Scotland funds being used for revenue. Now, I fully accept the Finance Secretary will protect as much money as she can. But can I note that the imperative of net zero and the imperative of growing the economy both hinge on using this money, ideally by crowding in private investment and the Scottish government potentially taking a golden share to reach the £1.5 billion set out in the statement. Thank you. Thank you. I now call Liz Smith to be followed by Kenneth Gibson. Up to four minutes, Ms Smith. Uh, thank you. Now, yesterday during her statement, the Cabinet Secretary for Finance said that she felt that the opposition members should put on the table what we would do differently with the nation's finances. I agree with her with that, and I look forward to taking up that challenge in the next three months. But before I do, can I just uh, say something about what I think has happened this summer? Firstly, there has been confirmation from the independent analysts that the fiscal predicament in which the Scottish Government finds itself has largely resulted from decisions that have been taken right here in Holyrood. Secondly, we are nowhere near level of uh, public service reform that we would like to be, and therefore we are not delivering the efficiencies and the greater savings that certainly the Finance Committee has been calling for for quite some time. And I think there has also been a recognition in quite a few quarters that it is time to examine, with evidence, uh, the case for some universal payments. And that was something I noted very carefully yesterday that the Cabinet Secretary acknowledged. Now, take away all the constitutional debate about how to interpret the jurors' statistics, and I know that's difficult, but the current demographic trends, the fact that we have a very high incidence of economic activity, which is true elsewhere, plus the fact that the Scottish economy has been seriously lagging behind the UK economy for at least a decade, we are not in any way producing the growth which we desperately need in order to pay for a much increasing dependent population. And that's a point. Yes, of course. First Minister. I, I'm, I'm grateful to Liz Smith for giving me. One of the issues that Liz Smith has uh, championed in her time in the Parliament has been the issue of migration. She has been very open-minded about the benefits of economic migration to Scotland. I wonder if, in her analysis of the economic situation that we, situation that we face, and the importance that's attached to population growth as a driver of economic growth, if she would reaffirm her support for some of the measures I announced today about a rural visa pilot, for example, to encourage and to motivate greater migration into some parts of our country. Yeah. Liz Smith. Uh, yes, I will, because I've said that before, and I will repeat that again. I've also said that about student uh, visas. I think there, I, I don't want a devolution uh, of uh, migration policy, but yes, I think there is a case for that, so I'm very happy to put that back on uh, the record. But can I just come back to what business is saying? Because they worry greatly about the increasing tax burden that is upon them and the effect that that's having on middle to high earners, who we desperately need for some of the uh, industries that the First Minister was talking about. We have to attract them to Scotland. That's financial services, energy, technology, food and drink. Scotland has the latent potential, but we need to develop that and develop it fast. So can I just say what I think needs to happen? Firstly, the budget choices as well as the rhetoric, have to reflect economic growth. And that didn't happen uh, last February when, for some inexplicable reason, the SNP government made an 8.3% real terms cut in the economy portfolio. I don't understand that. I didn't understand it at the time, and I don't understand it now. Because, not surprisingly, that budget was met with considerable uh, dismay across the business community. Secondly, as the Finance Committee has been highlighting for quite some time, there has to be meaningful public sector reform which will make the public sector more efficient because we're nowhere near being able to do that just now. From the evidence that the Committee has taken and from the analysis that uh, accompanies that, 
it is just not an option to go on as we are. In fact, I, I would suggest to the First Minister that that should also be a very considerable priority for the Scottish Government, because uh, in terms of the delivery, it is all very well paying public sector um, workers more, as we would obviously all like to do, but we can't go on doing that without getting better services in return, because the public is not going to wear that at all. And on tax, the very last thing that we should be doing is to make Scotland uncompetitive with England, because that's exactly what's happening just now. And yesterday I flagged up the fact that I think there is a very different opinion between the Deputy First Minister about tax policy you do and need the to First wind Minister. Up. I'll just finish it in a minute, because I think this point uh, has to be uh, taken on board by those in government, because you're giving out a mixed message as to what has to happen. And if there's one thing that I finish off on, Deputy Presiding Officer, it is that. Please, can we get some clarity about tax policy and how that is supposed to help economic growth? Thank you. I now call Kenneth Gibson to be followed by Pam Duncan Glancy. Up to four minutes, Mr. Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This programme for government is necessarily both realistic and robust as a prolonged era of austerity imposed upon Scotland by successive Labour, Coalition and Tory UK governments over the past 16 years limits Scottish government actions in the fiscal context in which it operates. I wholeheartedly agree with the Finance Secretary's response to last week's Prime Ministerial speech when she said, and I quote, the political choices being made by the new UK government will fundamentally damage the Scottish government's ability to deliver public services in Scotland. It's a rerun of 1997 all over again. Back then, New Labour's first budget cut public spending. As a Glasgow City Councillor, I saw cuts in mass redundancies imposed, leading to demonstrations in George Square, and councils being sneaked out the back door. There are other parallels from Labour's déjà vu playbook. Despite no mention in its 97 manifesto, immediately the results were in. Labour announced the introduction of university tuition fees, cynically calculating it wouldn't impact on them electorally four or five years later. This time, it's a winter fuel payment. There was no inkling in the manifesto. No doubt Labour hope voters will simply forget. No impact assessment was undertaken on withdrawing the payment from 10 million UK pensioners. Labour's manifesto didn't mention rising energy bills or prisoner releases in England either, or cuts to AI development in Scotland. And no one believes the Chancellor didn't know about the financial black hole bequeathed by the Tories. All shadow ministers routinely meet civil service heads and treasury officials on the run-up to a UK general election, even if it hadn't been telegraphed by the Institute for Fiscal Studies. The new UK prospectus forces Scottish ministers to make tough decisions and reallocate limited resources after years working to offset the worst excesses of UK austerity and welfare cuts. Mr Mara. Briefly, uh, Michael Mara. I appreciate the member giving way. Does not recognise that OBR have actually uh, take, noted the fact that many of the issues that were bequeathed to Labour in that bu their budget well, really. were a massive black hole, including particularly uh, issues around asylum seeker and refugee uh, home homelessness in, in the UK? And they have actually written a letter uh, dictating that. Gibson. If Everyone Kenneth knew Gibson. about. This year, uh, mitigation uh, of, of UK welfare cuts will cost this government £133.7 million. I believe cuts telegraphed by the Chancellor mean those resources must be redirected into devolved areas. Of course, according to Anna Sarwa, Labour, and I quote, will put Scotland at the heart of government, close quote. This includes Secretary of State for Scotland, Ian Murray, who frequently criticised SNP mitigation, stating... And I quote, the only sure way to get the bedroom tax repeal will be to elect a Labour government. <laughs> Labour should now scrap the bedroom tax across the UK, eliminating any need for mitigation. Indeed, if the Labour government also mirrored the £26.70 per child per week Scottish child payment across the UK, it would free up £429 million a year for Scottish ministers yeah. to invest in further anti-poverty measures and public services. Nothing. But don't hold your breath. For Scotland to escape the cycle of UK government cuts and emergency reallocation of funds mid-year, we must widen our tax base by growing our economy. Resources must increasingly focus on innovation, research and development and start-ups. And I was pleased to hear the First Minister's commitment to this. We have the talent, skills and many facilities essential to become Europe's fastest growing start-up economy. Scotland's 42 million tech scaler network, mentoring and incubation space for new tech businesses has already levered in 70 million of private monies. Scottish enterprises driven up levels of innovation, internationalisation and investment. 
working with over 1,300 companies and partners to enable Creator Safeguard 16,700 jobs, including a five-year high in new jobs from foreign direct investment, 60 per cent in the energy transition. My own constituency will, will enjoy £1.4 billion of XLCC investment in Tanterson, creating 900 direct green jobs on site by 2028. And Life Sciences Scotland's second biggest export, securing investment out with Cambridge, Oxford and London is not easy. Dundee University supports 9,400 jobs and generated almost a billion for our economy last year, not least through its Doug Discovery Unit, which is unique in excellence, research scale and industrial partnerships with the private sector. Presenting officer, just £5 million proof of concept money from Scottish ministers could, the university attests, leave around £200 million more of further uh, private investment. Stimulating economic growth will enable public service delivery to the high standard expected by Scotland's people. The programme for government has no blames and objectives, and I urge members to support it. Thank you. I now call Pam Duncan Glancy to be followed by Emma Harper up to four minutes. Ms Duncan Glancy. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I'm pleased to be able to speak today on this year's programme for government because the stakes couldn't be higher. For too many of my constituents in the region of Glasgow and indeed across Scotland, NHS waiting lists are too long, the attainment gap is widening, teachers are losing their jobs, disabled people are living without the services they need, social care is on its knees, and the SNP's financial chaos means more cuts are looming. At a time when people needed their government to step up, their government has stepped back, grown out of touch and run out of ideas. Last week, the First Minister met with Glasgow Disability Alliance, who I know will have raised concern over reduced services like social care. But yesterday, the Finance Secretary told the Finance Committee there are to be £13 million of cuts in adult social care, partly because uptake of the new ILF that they delayed delivery of wasn't what it should be. These cuts will terrify disabled people. And, presiding officer, the promised transition strategy doesn't even get a mention, despite the government rejecting my bill on the promise that a strategy would come. This has to change. And on health, presiding officer, I heard nothing in today's statement that will help my constituent who has been waiting for knee surgery for two years, or promises on mental health waits ring hollow when the Cabinet Secretary for Finance slashed £18.18 .18 million from that budget yesterday. President Officer, people in Glasgow deserve better. So too do the people of Scotland, none more than young people, and I want to use the rest of my time today to talk about them and education. The programme for government says it includes implementi implementing the delayed behaviour action plan, but there's no resource behind it to help staff and schools deliver it. Yesterday, the Cabinet Secretary dodged my suggestion of ditching the Centre for Teaching Excellence that no one wants and giving that money to schools to implement the plan, and I hope the First Minister might consider this today. I will take that intervention. I thank Jenny the Gilbert. member for the opportunity to clarify. I did not suggest that her suggestion was ditched. What I said was we need to continue to invest in Scotland's teaching profession through the Centre for Teaching Excellence. And I think we need additionality. The question I put to the member, and perhaps you can answer it today, is when am I going to receive confirmation from the Labour government on the alleged consequentials that are coming as a result of VAT changes to the private sector and on the consequentials from the 6,500 extra briefly, teachers that the Labour Party were elected on? I would like confirmation Pam Duncan so that I can Pam Duncan Glancy. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's intervention, and she knows fine well that she will, find, that she will hear clarity on that after the budget. And, and the Cabinet Secretary also says that delivering excellence in equity in education is our top priority, but that she can't do it with fewer teachers. But the government is slashing teacher numbers. Just ask people in Glasgow. It's also overworking them and stripping resources from education and local government. And how can we have the highest quality learning for all when this government is presiding over a 17% attainment gap that goes back, I'm afraid, to this First Minister's time as Education Secretary? The government used to plan to close that gap, and I note today that they've revised down their ambition to simply reduce it. The First Minister says his government will drive improvement, raise standards and ensure the needs of learners are at the forefront of their work by implementing curriculum improvement and progressing reform of the national education bodies. But I'm afraid a rebrand is not reform. No effective voice for teachers or learners is not reform. And letting the qualifications body that marked down the poorest pupils mark its own homework is not reform. 
The First Minister also said much of growth today, but there is nothing there to help colleges or universities who are essential for that and who are struggling under, and I quote from evidence we had in the, the Education Committee, their toughest funding settlement after years of SNP mismanagement. Presiding officer, this SNP's government's record on education is a litany of failure and broken promises on closing the attainment gap, class sizes, non-contact time, free school meals for all pupils, or digital devices. It can't go on. We need an end to broken promises and economic financial mismanagement. Scotland needs hope. And my colleagues and I, then my colleagues and I, they have it because we believe our best days lie ahead of us. We can turn the page on economic mismanagement and return to a Scotland where everyone has the opportunity to flourish. Thank you, Thank Presiding you. Officer. I now call uh, Emma Harper to be followed by Rachel Hamilton up to four minutes. Ms Harper. Thank you, President Officer. I welcome the opportunity to speak in the programme for government debate. So much has been mentioned which will need to be dissected in the coming weeks. Um, this year's programme for government has set out clear actions to deliver real change for the people of Scotland. This against the most challenging financial, back, financial backdrop since our Parliament was reconvened. The, pri the Prime Minister was clear last week that the UK budget to de delivered in October will be painful and the reality the reality is that the UK's finances will inevitably affect the funding available to us here in Scotland. The SNP Scottish Government will continue to prioritise action to eradicate child poverty, to grasp the opportunities of delivering net zero and to grow the economy by attracting business investment and by bolstering our public services. While the Scottish Government will work with the UK Government wherever it can, it will continue to urge the UK Government to drop its impending damaging austerity agenda. Presiding officer, I'm just going to make two points. Number one is Labour's shameless cut to the winter fuel payment, which will hit older people in Dumfries and Galloway and the borders particularly hard. And the second point is how the PFG will benefit Dumfries and Galloway. Labour's plan to strictly means test the winter fuel payment in England and Wales sees the Scottish Government funding for this new devolved benefit suddenly reduced by £168 million. Devolving a benefit shortly after removing almost its entire budget is disrespectful to everybody involved in shaping the new policy in Scotland. This cut undermines the devolution settlement and ignores the importance of this payment to Scottish households who face harsher winters and higher energy costs. This will hit our pensioners in rural communities like NDNG and the borders particularly hard. The fact that this cut is coming from Labour, the party which just six weeks ago said that they would, and I quote, give pensioners security in retirement. In June, Anna Sarwar said, read my lips, no austerity under Labour. And by the way, that soundbite, read my lips, actually came from right-wing Republican President George Bush Sr.'s 1988 address to the Republican Convention. So it's hardly surprising that Anas Sarwar is aligning himself with the right-wing Republican playbook. Labour's decision was made without any consultation with the Scottish Government, undermining the commitments given by Keir Starmer to establish a better working relationship. It's shameful, and I call on the UK Government to reverse this cut. Presiding officer, I do welcome that the SNP Government has prioritised economic growth, helping businesses, including in DNG, to grow and flourish. From tourism to finance and technology to food and drink exports, the Scottish Government will work to create growth, create jobs and maximise the huge economic opportunities that lie ahead. I welcome that the First Minister has included programme for government items in terms of innovation, supporting entrepreneurs and AI and digital technology. We know how valuable AI can be in healthcare and rem remind Chamber that I am still a registered nurse. The First Minister is clear the SNP Scottish Government is a firmly pro-business administration. Scotland is open for business. The SNP is acutely aware of the enormous pressures facing businesses across the country and is taking decisive steps to offer support despite limited powers and working within a challenging budget. This includes investing more than £5 million across the Scottish Government to grow and transform our economic landscape, using every tool at our disposal at our disposal to maximise economic growth for a clear purpose. So, finally, presiding officer, I again I welcome this programme for government. It's good for our priorities, it's good for our people, and it's good for our communities. Thank you.
Thank you. I, I now call Rachel Hamilton to be followed by Michael Myra. Up to four minutes, Ms Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I welcome the First Minister's statement today, but the time for empty promises is running out. Every year, the Government sets out their agenda in an attempt to improve lives across Scotland. Yet when it comes to implementing it, they consistently fall short of the mark. Instead of delivering for Scotland, the Scottish Government, through their own spending choices, have delivered an ever-gaping financial black hole. Presiding officer, it's alarming that beyond ditching their own climate change goals, that the SNP would defund conservation to plug other holes they have created in their own spending decisions. Councils and Nature Scott will be left with nothing to spend on preserving our beautiful natural environment for future generations. We, on these benches, urge ministers to reconsider the damage this will cause to at-risk species and properly fund councils for any deals they have struck elsewhere. Nature should not be a trivial consideration for the SNP, as this would suggest. Presiding officer, as in uh, previous years, this programme for government is nothing more than rhetoric designed to conceal a lack of substance and ambition. And rural communities will again be disappointed with today's announcements. Freed from the shackles of the Green Party, the government had the opportunity to bring forward sensible and pragmatic plans that would afford them the chance to reset. But whilst the Butte House agreement is over, its legacy of broken promises continues. Rural issues were scarcely mentioned in the First Minister's statement or in the programme for government, and farmers are still out of pocket by the tune of 46 million of ring-fenced funding. It was taken from the agricultural budget, leaving those who rely on that money with uncertainty and feeling let down. Yes? Jim Fairley. Does the member recall when we were in the uh, Rural Affairs Committee that Johnny Hall sat in the chamber or in the committee and told our committee that not a single penny of the funding that was delivering being delivered to agricultural community had not been spent, and that was a Treasury issue. That the Treasury confirmed that, not the Scottish Government. Still Hamilton. Well, Jim Fairley will remember all the uh, the to and fro in the chamber with the Finance Secretary, who promised to return that money, the £46 million. So the Finance Secretary, your own Finance Secretary in this SNP Government, has acknowledged that that money has been removed, and so has the Cabinet Secretary, Mary Goujon. So Jim Fairley is confusing the issue with his own Cabinet's uh, account of, uh, and recollection. I welcome the First Minister's acknowledgement that we need to build more homes, but with only 10% of new affordable homes being built in rural areas, which account for 17% of the population, it's clear that their actions to date have failed to address this urgent issue, exacerbating, exacerbating the issues of depopulation and driving young people out of their own areas. Yes? Very um, briefly, Christine Graham. Does the member think it unfortunate that the Tory-led Borders Council handed back eight million to the Scottish Government because they failed to spend it timelessly on building houses? Yeah. Rachel Hamilton. So, what I think is that the uh, housing budget needs to sort out the issues of depopulation across Scotland, and it's not doing that because it's driving young people out of Scotland. And moreover, so is the taxation policy. Significant inequalities relating to mental health care for adults and young people continue to hit rural communities. Young people in the borders are being let down today. They were let down yesterday, last month, last year, with this government, with only 40% starting CAMS treatment within the 18-week target. And, presiding officer, I'm contacted daily by constituents who struggle to access mental health support. It's simply unacceptable that my constituents and our constituents and residents across Scotland must wait until 2025 for the government to fix their own problems over this. I will conclude, presiding officer, there's so much more I could say, but let's just say, presiding officer, we had a fantastic uh, potential for rural communities and for this government to deliver. They've let them down. Thank you. I now call uh, Michael Mara to be followed by Stuart McMillan. Up to four minutes, Mr Mara. Thank you, President Officer. It started off with a, a rather um, sleepy affair uh, from the Scottish Government. And it is a 
fair reflection, I think, of a government that, frankly, has lost touch with the public um, after years of scandal and incompetence that has lost its way. And as we heard yesterday, it simply cannot be trusted with the public's money. But it's also very difficult to see in this uh, document that's set before us today and in the First Minister's speech what is actually new. We should perhaps look at some of last year's commitments. Uh, they, uh, they failed to reduce the NHS, NHS waiting lists, as they promised last year, now at a record high, with almost one in six Scots facing those waits. They failed to improve the cancer outcomes, as they promised to do last year. Targets continue to be missed. They failed to close the attainment gap, as they promised to do, not just last year, but many years before, with attainment in schools actually dropping in the latest results. And they failed to produce key strategies for industry, for the energy sector and for our environment. They failed also to deal with our court backlog and our justice system. So it's little wonder that people are sceptical when they hear some of the promises and assurances given from the First Minister and some of his colleagues today. And I think he would look carefully at the example of our artistic sector, the Creative Scotland funding. And he would recognise, I hope, the very real concern and anger amongst that community, people's livelihoods, people who often earn very low wages, pursuing uh, uh, occupations that they love, adding very much not just to our economy, but to our society and our culture. And the great fear that they have lived in in recent weeks is a very chaotic approach, frankly, of this government in terms of its finances and its agencies have put them in fear of their livelihoods. So I think it's right, then, uh, uh, no surprise, that there will still be protests here over this week from members of that sector who very much doubt some of the assurances that he has given them today. Because those cuts have been made the, 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 uh, previously, the money has been put back in place, then it's been taken out again, then it's been put back in again. It's just an example of a chaotic approach of his government. Meanwhile, a UK Labour government is getting on with fixing the foundations of our economy. It's rebuilding the start of a long job of rebuilding our public finances and putting politics back firmly in the service of working people. And I'll tell you what we're doing to start that process. We've introduced legislation to establish GB Energy, a publicly owned energy company that will bring down energy bills. Labour's New Deal for Working People, banning exploitative zero-hour contracts and practices across our economy. We've commissioned a task force to take a deep dive and address the root causes of child poverty. We're closing loopholes in the non-DOM status. No, thank you. We're closing loopholes in the non-DOM status uh, so we can put more money into our public services. So we're fixing those public spending issues, and that is absolutely critical. No, thank you. If only someone, if only someone had thought of the idea of looking at the resources, look at, no, thank you, sir. No, thank you. Again. If only someone had come up with the idea of looking at the resources, looking at the spending, perhaps having a review. They might have called it the resource spending review. And maybe the Deputy First Minister will recognise her words that we had to set out a realistic public spending framework for the years ahead that does not ignore the realities of our financial position. If only. Because it's exactly what her colleagues went on to do. On the 13th of June 2023, Shona Robson told a finance committee that the resource spending review was a bit of a blunt tool, that the policy needs to be more nuanced than that. More nuanced. Instead, we got three emergency budgets of financial chaos and cuts presided over by these finance secretary and this cabinet. You need to so wind little up. wonder the mess that's been made and little wonder the lack of faith that people will have in the statement that's been made today. Thank you. I now call the final speaker in the open debate, Stuart McMillan, up to four minutes. Mr McMillan. Uh, thank you very much, Prime Minister. Prime Minister, we have been presented with a programme for government today that will prioritise action to eradicate child poverty, regardless of the mounting financial challenge facing this SNP government. The SNP and government already have a strong track record of improving lives in challenging circumstances, but the SNP want to go further, and that's why, that's why the First Minister has made eradicating child poverty his central mission, alongside working with business and industry to grow the economy, investing in net zero, and also delivering stronger public services. Now, in Scotland, we already have significantly lower child poverty levels than England and Wales, but that should be no cause for celebration 
We can and we must do more. Now, this year, the Scottish Government policies like the Scottish Child Payment are keeping an estimated 100,000 children out of relative poverty. And a further 40,000 children could have been lifted out of poverty if the Labour Government, the new Labour Westminster Government, had voted with the SNP to scrap the two child yeah. benefit cap. In my Green and Inver Clyde constituency, over 1,000 children are estimated to be missing out on receiving vital financial support due to this abhorrent policy. So no matter whether it's Labour or the Tories, the SNP government's efforts to eradicate child poverty is being undermined by Westminster at every single step. However, as the First Minister has emphasised today, and even when faced with unprecedented budgetary controls, due to the constitutional constraints, the Scottish Government's aim it will be to improve people's lives by focusing <laughs> on clear priorities that make the biggest difference. Now, I want to touch upon a few of the announcements made by the First Minister. Now, I welcome the announcement of the special support for disabled people to be enhanced across all local authorities by the summer of 2025. The reform of primary care to increase capacity and access to general practice, community pharmacy, dental and community eye care services by the end of 2026, and the additional £120 million for health boards to support continued improvements across a range of mental health services and treatments. All of these will be welcomed by my Greenock and Inverclyde constituents. It's something that they have been lobbying me for, and I have lobbied the Scottish Government for, and I welcome them. The introduction of the new post-school education reform bill aimed to tackle economic inactivity and skill shortages in our workforce and remove barriers to employment was also one of the areas highlighted by the Inverclyde Socio-Economic Task Force to the Scottish Government. So I'm sure that they will also welcome this new bill coming in. Now, reviewing Creative Scotland will be welcomed widely, and as a former member of the parliamentary committee that engaged with the body, I'm sure that I will not be alone in the chamber in hoping that the review considers how the body can ensure how it is embedded in the towns and villages across the country, and not just in the cities. Now, presenting officer, this is a programme for government that will assist many of my constituents. And also, and also individuals across the country. So I support it. And despite, despite over 14 years of austerity under the Tories, and austerity 2.0, now underway by Labour, I was shocked by the admission earlier from Anis Sarwa when he said he was, and I quote, optimistic about the future. His read my lips no austerity under Labour defies comprehension yeah. when his London boss tells everyone the upcoming Labour budget will be painful and things will only get worse. Yeah. So I will ensure, Mr Sarwa, I will ensure that when I am talking to my constituents, when folk are going to the local food bank for the collection days, and also when pensioners are struggling to actually heat their homes, I will let them know that you are optimistic about their future. Thank you. Thank you. We move to winding up speeches, and I call on Patrick Harvey up to five minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Well, I think we've heard uh, a few familiar tunes uh, this afternoon uh, from the Conservatives, uh, the, the familiar tune that we need to be spending much more on everything but raising much less tax. Uh, that's no great surprise there. Uh, from, from the Labour Party, who used to recognise the context uh, of its austerity being imposed by a Tory UK government, uh, now that uh, it's a Labour UK government that's imposing Tory fiscal rules, that context seems a bit less relevant somehow. Uh, so their tune might be changing a little, but not, not necessarily for the better. As for the, as for the SNP, the First Minister tells us he wants to govern harder and stronger. I'm not really sure what that means, but I certainly think it shouldn't mean I certainly think it shouldn't mean uh, abandoning the most marginalised in our society, and I'm afraid there is starting to be an element of that creeping into the government's programme. Not just some of the, the recent decisions, such as cutting uh, the provision of free bus travel for asylum seekers, such a small amount of money that that policy costs, such a small amount of money, but such a massive benefit to the individuals affected. Uh, but it's now entirely unclear what the government's position going forward on free school meals is going to be. It would be helpful if the, uh, the government could respond on that in the closing. Uh, there now appear to be threats to water down rent controls. 
Uh, and I'm quite sure that the landlord lobby are working overtime to ensure that profiteering in the private rented sector can continue. But it's essential that the government and the parliament stands up for tenants' rights if those amendments seek to water it down. Uh, I'm pleased that the Creative Scotland cuts have been reversed, but the huge anxiety that's been created uh, during that period was entirely avoidable. Uh, and the decision to abandon the uh, commitment to legislate in Scotland on conversion practices, which my colleague referred to, I see that the Equality Network have already responded, saying that the benefits of a Four Nations approach do not make up for the downsides of waiting for a Westminster Bill, namely the Scottish Government uh, losing control of the Bill's content and timeline. I give way. Surely Anne Somerville. Uh, I hope to be able to reassure uh, the member that uh, the Scottish Government continues to work on a Scottish Bill on ending conversion practices. We do hope to take it forward on a Four Nations approach, but if that is not possible, the work is continuing, the pace has not changed, and we will continue that work. And I look forward to working with Green colleagues on that. Patrick Harvey. Uh, I, I think the Cabinet Secretary as an individual is someone who is fully committed to the principle, but the Government needs to be fully committed to the principle and to the reality of introducing that bill here to the Scottish Parliament and letting us legislate on it. Uh, I want to, to move on and talk about some of the other things that aren't in there. The, the Human Rights Bill isn't in there, and that's also been criticised by some people outside the Chamber. It does lose us the opportunity. It loses us the opportunity to legislate for the right to a healthy environment. Perhaps the government decided that legislating for the right to a healthy environment at the same time as raiding the Nature Restoration Fund uh, would have lacked credibility. The Nature Restoration Fund, which I remind Rachel Hamilton, who's such a fan of it, the, the Greens created that as a result of the Butte House Agreement that I know she's so uh, obsessed with. As for the climate bill, we know that a new climate bill is going to be necessary. It needs to be a moment of radical honesty, of Scotland acknowledging that we are years behind where we should be on emissions reduction because there hasn't been that willingness. At a political level, uh, there hasn't been the political will to change transport policy, the way we heat our buildings, uh, the way we, uh, we uh, uh, use land uh, and what kind of agriculture we subsidise. So a new bill, if it's going to be tolerable, if it's going to be supportable, has to be in the context of an acceleration of immediate action, not waiting until after carbon budgets are set, after advice has been taken and after a new climate plan has been produced. That would leave paralysis for most of the rest of this parliamentary session, if not longer. So if a new climate change bill is to seek political support from this part of the, the chamber, it will need to be in the context of a radical acceleration of climate action uh, in the short term. Presiding officer, in closing, let me just say that there are warning signs uh, since the, the SNP moved into, by choice, moved into minority government, that they seem determined now to abandon the trust uh, of those Scots who wanted a progressive equal Scotland, a Scotland that's willing to redistribute wealth in order to tackle austerity and that's willing to invest in bold and urgent climate action. As my colleague Lorna Slater said, there is still 18 months in which to prove those fears wrong and to commit to the bold action that's necessary. If the SNP abandons that, at that project, the Greens certainly won't. Thank you. And I call on Jackie Bailey. Up to seven minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It's safe to say it's been a long summer, one that should occasion a period of reflection for the SNP, and you would, of course, expect to see recognition of that in the programme for government. The SNP went from 48 MPs in the UK Parliament to now only having nine MPs. And that's what happens when voters think you have nothing to offer them. Whether it's the disappointment for indeed some of their members that after 17 years the SNP are no closer to delivering independence, or the more recent problems with Police Scotland, or whether it's the very real anger at the lack of competence in government. Voters are angry at the failure to deliver even the most basic of services, and that anger is focused by the SNP's record of government in Holyrood. The lack of progress in tackling NHS waiting lists, the continuing attainment gap, the housing emergency, and increasing numbers of people sleeping rough on our streets. 
all these failures the responsibility of this SNP government. And people in communities across the country are being offered no hope, no vision, no ideas for making their lives better for the future. That is so depressing when Scotland and its people have so much potential. Scotland's best days do lie ahead of it, but will not be realised with this depressing, incompetent government. Let's look at the charge seat, sheet, presiding officer. Let me start with the financial position. Yesterday, the finance secretary went through contortions to tell us that she wasn't to blame for any of the problems with the almost one billion shortfall in her budget. It was all Westminster's fault, and it was the fault of a UK Labour government that has been in office for eight weeks. Eight weeks. It was nothing to do with decisions she or her predecessors made. Go look somewhere else to lay the blame, she said. Shame that she ignored what the Scottish Fiscal Commission, the Fraser of Allender Institute, the Institute of Fiscal Studies and Audit Scotland had all said. These are decisions she and her government made that are coming home to roost. Yep, yep. And Michael Mayer is right to call her out yesterday for diverting the £450 million of Scotland money because this is a one-off payment. It needs to be found again in the new financial year and this will have an effect on the delivery of the programme for government. Can I say as gently as I can to the Cabinet Secretary for Health that actually he should spend more time listening and reflecting than trying to interrupt me. Pam Duncan Glancy and her contribution highlighted the paucity of thinking Members. by the SNP on education. Everything from the failure to close the attainment gap to the removal of hundreds of teachers from the classroom. The First Minister also told us about changes he is making to the Ministerial Code in the context of the secrecy and lack of transparency he was responsible for during the Salmond inquiry. This is just beyond funny. But what about the recommendation from James Hamilton Casey that special advisers should be subject to elements of the Ministerial Code? Oh no, nothing there at all from John Swinney. Let me turn to health where the SNP's failures are most stark and Neil Gray should listen. Waiting list. Miss Bailey, Miss Bailey. Thank you. Can we all hear how the chamber is just now? <laughs> Let's imagine that and the one person who's been called to speak is speaking, Miss Bailey. Thank you so much, Presiding Officer. Waiting lists now at a staggering 864,000 people. One in six of our fellow Scots, the highest on record. But the Scottish Government promised to bring waiting lists down in the last programme for government. Another SNP failure. Delayed discharge, also at a record high. And it wasn't so long ago that the Finance Secretary was Health Minister and declared that delayed discharge would end. Another SNP failure. Or what about cancer treatment targets? The 62-day target has not been met in 12 years since it was introduced. Now the 31-day target is being missed. Another SNP failure. Delays in A&E are now normalised. Winter pressures are now all year round. Another SNP failure. And the use of the private sector has almost doubled, with 36% of all hip and knee operations done privately because people cannot wait any longer in pain. I welcome very much the attitude taken by the SNP government when they keep protesting that they are not creating a two-tier health service. But that is exactly what this SNP government is presiding over. Sir. over. Let me thank the staff who work for the NHS for all that they do. They are let down by this government and so too are patients as excess deaths are up and the government failure is literally costing lives. And what the Finance Secretary really didn't want to talk about yesterday were the cuts that health boards are having to make right now. Caroline Lamb, Chief Executive of NHS Scotland, told health boards in June that the expectation for a £1.1 billion shortfall in the NHS budget. In Greater Glasgow and Clyde alone, the deficit is about £226 million. This will impact, no, this will impact on frontline services and staff. The Finance Secretary said that essential staff would be protected. So why then 
Are vacancies for nurses and consultants frozen? I didn't get an answer from her yesterday, so maybe she can try again before, because this is going on under her nose. And as the staff are not replaced, so the pressure on those that remain increases and they risk burnout. Cuts to mental health services, cuts to primary care, cuts to services for disabled people. Have this government no shame at all? All this government has is a sticking plaster approach, no vision and no solutions. And as Sawa was right, it's clear that the SNP government has lost its way and its incompetence is failing the people of Scotland. This programme for government is a missed opportunity, but then so too was the last one. It effectively demonstrates that the SNP record is one of abandoning its flagship pledges, missing its own targets and leaving every institution in Scotland weaker. The SNP presiding officer are out of ideas, they're out of time and the people of Scotland increasingly want them out of office too. Thank you and I call on Craig Hoy up to eight minutes please. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. This debate has taken place in the week that the chickens have come home to roost for the First Minister and his failing government. On their watch, Scotland has become a high-tax, low-growth economy. Public services are crumbling, unable to cope after 17 years of the SNP's incompetence and mismanagement. Drug deaths, unmentioned by the First Minister, are soaring. Waiting times remain high. The pupil attainment gap is growing. Lifeline ferries have failed to be delivered. All of this combined to produce the SNP's reverse Midas touch, a unique ability to spend more and at the same time deliver less. And as my colleagues Douglas Ross and Liz Smith rightly said, this government has mismanaged the tax system, mismanaged public sector pay negotiations, mismanaged largely unreformed public services, and it has woefully mismanaged the public finances. And as Rachel Hamilton said, it is no surprise, therefore, that the Finance Secretary was yesterday forced to come to this Parliament to reveal a £1 billion in-year budget black hole. A black hole of the SNP's making and their making alone. A black hole that Shona Robertson conceded will have a profound effect on this Government's ability to deliver public services and public service reform. And yet, the First Minister confirmed this weekend that one of the only areas to be protected from the SNP's cuts agenda is the Scottish Government's independence unit. They are still prioritising spending on party political propaganda at the expense of Scotland's patients and Scotland's pupils. Now, I listened carefully to SNP members today, to Michelle Thompson, to Stuart McMillan, Kenneth Gibson and Emma Harper, and they all played the blame game. Frankly, I do not know what is in the water on the SNP floors of this building, but there has been a sudden and severe outbreak of delusion amongst its MSPs. And contrary to... I, I, I will give way. Michelle Thompson. I'm merely pointing out that the macro econ economy resides with Westminster. And you make the point about the Scottish Government's budget. It has to operate to a fixed budget, and yet the UK Government consistently has borrowed massively to the extent to which debt to GDT GDP is now 88.8%. How's that for fiscal rectitude? Three coins. In part, in, in, in part, that borrowing was to fund this country through the COVID pandemic and in part to make sure that we are properly funding public services. Let's but hear Mr. Mr. Swinney, Hoy. But Mr Swinney has been Finance Secretary for long enough to realise that he has to balance the books. But contrary to what has happened, but contrary, contrary to what has happened, Mr Swinney, this didn't arrive, this, this budget deficit did not arise by chance. It didn't arise because of Westminster. It didn't arise because of Brexit or the war in Ukraine. It arrived because the SNP government has repeatedly made a series of bad decisions and wrong calls yep. on the pace and scale of public sector reform, on tax. No, I, I won't at the moment. I will come to you in a minute. No, I will come to you in a minute. I, I, I will give way if Mr Swinney can answer this simple question. Why are Scots today being taxed more when your government delivers less? Yeah, yeah. Well, that, First that, Minister. That's, that, that's not the case because, well, 
In, in, in Scotland, uh, people have eligibility for more access to air learning and childcare than in any other part of the United Kingdom. Yeah. Young people get to university without paying tuition fees. Yeah. Yeah. Mr Hoy and his colleagues don't pay for prescri prescription fees. Uh, there's an availability of free personal care for the elderly. That's what people get for their taxes in Scotland, which they don't get in any other part of the United Kingdom. But a question I wanted to ask Mr Hoy was this. Does he believe that the shocking economic performance of the public finances in the United Kingdom has anything to do with Liz Truss's budget, the war in Ukraine, COVID pandemic, and spiralling inflation as a consequence of Conservative decisions? Because if it has, his attack on the SNP government is absolutely fatuous. Yeah. This, is, this is John Swinney's programme for government. These are John Swinney's cuts, and he yep. needs to own them. Exactly. Presiding officer. Presiding officer, this is John Swinney's first and perhaps his last programme Let's for government, hear Mr. Hoy. and it is very thin indeed. Now, there are some elements that can be cautiously welcomed. The renewed commitment to our policy of free ports, Mr Swinney, an additional £100 million for more mid-market homes, but only after they slashed the housing budget last year. The focus on the further education sector and enhancing Scotland's skills, something long neglected by the SNP. Changes to the ministerial code, so the First Minister no longer sits in judgment on himself, although I note that this Parliament will still have no role in that process. I also welcome the First Minister's renewed emphasis on re uh, reducing child poverty. Who wouldn't? But what is really going to change? How are we going to tackle the root causes of that poverty? Poor housing, poor pupil attainment and stubborn social stains, such as the effects of drug and alcohol misuse. In fact, this programme for government, as Pam Duncan Glancy said, waters down the government's commitment to re reducing the attainment gap. And in truth, one in four Scottish children are still living in relative poverty, light years away from the target of 10% by 2030 set by this government. And the government's own analysis says that the number of children growing up in poverty in Scotland today is broadly stable. In other words, despite all the extra expenditure, child poverty levels are the same or even higher than when the SNP came to power in 2007. Billions have been spent, but yet the dial is shifting in the wrong direction. This, this morning, the Finance Secretary appeared on radio to blame everybody but herself for her swinging cuts. She repeatedly insisted, insisted that the SNP was investing in welfare and investing in public sector pay. Noble that this may be, but if these policies don't improve outcomes, then they are not sustainable. And if they are not sustainable, then they cannot be classed as an investment. If investment in welfare is working, why are so many Scottish children still living in poverty? If investment in public sector pay is working, why has there been no improvement in productivity or service delivery? Why has the SNP not taken on board the advice of Audit Scotland and embarked on root and branch reform of the public sector? Why is the centrepiece of this programme for government not a bold and urgent and wide-reaching public sector performance and productivity bill decided to deliver real change in the way that we deliver public services? Instead, we get the vague commitment to a 10-year reform programme. Why are NHS waiting lists in Scotland so long, given, as the First Minister says, we've avoided strikes and we pay more to our NHS staff? Because, bluntly, SNP ministers have failed to rebuild, reform and renew our NHS. In truth, this is a First Minister leading a government that is simply not up to the job of delivering reform, because this is not a programme for government. This is a programme for managed decline, or under John Swinney, mismanaged decline. Yesterday, we found out they're out of money. Today, we find out they're out of ideas. An intellectually bankrupt First Minister leading a financially bankrupt government. Thank you. And I call on Kate Forbes to wind up. Up to 10 minutes, Deputy First Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Well, this programme for government sets out our commitment to deliver, focusing on four key priorities, eradicating child poverty, growing the economy, tackling the climate emergency, and ensuring high quality, sustainable public services. And it does come against a difficult backdrop, a backdrop of an ongoing cost of living crisis, war in Europe, and decisions by the UK government to address its own £22 billion funding shortfall, 
all of which has studiously been ignored by the opposition in their comments this afternoon. Michelle Thompson captured some of the other challenges that we have. Inflation, the failure of budgets to keep pace with inflation, costs continuing to rise, before we talk about the self-inflicted budget decisions of Liz Truss. It looks like the Conservatives are still not facing up to reality. But despite that, we have set out a serious, clear and focused agenda to deliver for communities. It recognises our many strengths. That is surely a point we can agree on across the Chamber. Scotland's inward investment projects, which is worth more than rhetoric, grew by 12.7% in 2023. That is compared to 6% across the UK and a 4.5% fall across Europe. Thankfully, those investors ignore the opposition's rhetoric. We have also seen a rec... Uh, yes, I will. Alex Cole Hamilton. I am very grateful to the Deputy First Minister for giving way. One of our uh, many strengths, as she puts it, that we can all agree on is our tremendous uh, renewable potential, uh, generation and otherwise. Um, but yesterday we saw the Scottish Government plug half of the hole in our national finances with the remainder, the remainder of all of the revenue that was given from the licensing and the leasing of our seabed. Can she tell this chamber what plans the Scottish Government have to plug that same hole in next year's budget? I can Minister. tell the member about the £500 million that we're investing in offshore energy, including £67 million this year alone. I can talk about the fact that a Japanese company have invested £350 million in a cable factory. I can talk about the international investors that have invested in the port of Ardesir for the first time in decades because we have seen a record number of foreign direct investment projects here in Scotland, a top performing part of the UK outside London for nine years. The point is that international investors look to Scotland, they see projects that they can be proud of and they invest their funding because they see Scotland's strengths. Now, all parts of uh, Scotland, I believe, and all parties perhaps in this chamber, recognise that Scotland does have a wealth of natural resources. It has great talent. It has got community cohesion. And building on that, this programme for government wants to deliver prosperity, prosperity with a purpose. That purpose is to eradicate child poverty, ensure that our uh, public services are sustainable and to reach that net zero target. That is our clear aim and objectives. Now, Jackie Bailey talked about the charge sheet. And the sad thing for the Labour Party is that, yes, I agree with Anna Sarmer, we only have eight weeks to go on. But in those eight weeks, we went from a, a position of promising change that things will only get better to a Prime Minister articulating himself that things that will get worse. They were elected on a promise to reject austerity. We've already heard, read my lips. The Chancellor is the only person that appears to be surprised by the black hole in the UK's finances. And as Anasawa rightly said, that although they've only been in power for eight weeks, that's still enough time to strip pensioners of winter fuel payments. Yeah. Pensioners... enough time to turn a promise to reduce energy bills by £300 into an actual delivery of increasing energy bills by £149. Michael Mara. Does the Deputy First Minister not recognise that the job of fixing the public finances is the, the first priority of the UK Labour government? It was once her first priority and her plan was ditched. And that's why we're in the mess that we are now. Is that not right? Deputy well, First Minister. On the contrary, you know, it, it amuses me when you have the opposition simultaneously accusing us of underspending and overspending at the same time. We are a very proud government to have ensured every penny is spent 
in serving Scotland, providing 1140 hours of high quality early learning and childcare, providing free bus travel for uh, over 2 million people, offering free school meals and five family payments in terms of restoring dignity at the heart of our welfare system. These are initiatives that aren't all available elsewhere in the UK because we have pushed the spending envelope as far as possible because of the values that we stand on to eradicate child poverty, to deliver prosperity and to reach net zero. Now, Presiding officer, I wanted to talk about how we will build on our strengths, the strengths that hopefully all of us are agreed on here in Scotland to unlock Scotland's potential and deliver our aims. And we have set out a, a, a priority list of three areas in the economy to do that. And before I get on to that, I will take my last intervention. I, I'm Douglas Ross. grateful to the Deputy First Minister for giving way. She's speaking about building and priorities. Can she confirm or otherwise? Do the SNP still believe in fully duelling the A96 from Aberdeen to Inverness? And when will that be delivered? Because the promise was 2030. Well, um, First Minister. Can, can I say to uh, the member that as somebody who lives in the Highlands and who values the North, I absolutely uh, agree with our commitment to upgrade and to improve the A9 and the A96. In terms of uh, our programme of delivering economic prosperity with a purpose, there's three areas, presiding officer, I wanted to talk about. The first is a coordinated programme to attract investment in delivering net zero, building housing and to improving our infrastructure. The second is to ensure that the decision-making process is accelerated and streamlined with creating, for example, a planning hub and building capacity and resilience into the system. And the last is to support our people, to support entrepreneurs, to support more women into business and to ensure that we embed fair work in everything that we do. And with the few minutes I have remaining, I wanted to go through each of these in individually. On investment, we know that our public finances are constrained and so our commitment is to leverage and stimulate private investment with that coordinated programme to implement recommendations from the investor panel, to improve engagement with investors, to strengthen our capacity and capability in delivering and exploring new funding mechanisms such as blended finance and guarantees to ensure that there is a national project pipeline of investment opportunities. Very specifically looking at housing, we will invest £100 million to grow to £500 million with institutional investment to deliver at least uh, 2,800 mid-market rent homes on top of the public investment that we are putting in to affordable housing. Uh, secondly, on the decision-making, we know, look at the figures, that people want to invest in Scotland. So our commitment is to streamline and accelerate those opportunities, to support early adopters to develop a master plan consent area, front loading consents, including planning permission, including uh, for housing, and to ensure that there is enough planners in the system with a planned apprenticeship programme to invest in new talent. That sits alongside the work we're doing with communities to create local employment through the Community Wealth Building Bill. And then thirdly, presiding officer, on entrepreneurship, to build on the tech scaler programme, to support more women to start and grow a business, to integrate the tech scalers into manufacturing and industry so that we aren't creating jobs elsewhere with our talent and ingenuity. They are coming here to Scotland. And we will develop our strengths in data, digital, AI, health and life sciences to not only create jobs and deliver economic prosperity, but also to solve the big problems in the health service. And uh, anyone who wants an example of that need only look at Scottish brain sciences who have recently come to Scotland and whose aim is to cure Alzheimer's, working here in Scotland with the NHS uh, using that talent and ingenuity. And so, uh, presiding officer, as I come to a close, there are a number of uh, areas in the programme for government which are truly exciting. Michael Mara talked about the importance of our creative artists and our culture sector, absolutely, which is why it's great news that Angus Robertson has announced the release of £6.6 .6 million, including £3 million towards the Open Fund and a review of Creative Scotland to ensure that we support that sector as much as possible. And so, presiding officer, as I come to a conclusion, I would hope that everyone across the chamber believes in delivering prosperity. And there is no greater purpose for that prosperity than to eradicate poverty and to lift the next generation 
of children out of poverty, to embed fairness across Scotland. We have much that we could uh, dedicate time to in terms of our challenges and the issues that families are grappling with. But this is a programme for government that is built on optimism, on confidence and a clarity of vision. We will always employ every penny at our disposal to lift children out of poverty and to ensure we reach our other objectives. We cannot be accused of underspending and overspending at the same time. This is a programme for government that will use everything at our disposal to deliver for Scotland in the service of Scotland. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes the debate on programme for government. Um, point of order, Rachel Hamilton. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. I seek your advice on an intervention uh, from Christine Graham earlier in the debate. She suggested that a Conservative-led Scottish Borders local authority was responsible for an affordable housing supply underspend. This, presiding officer, was incorrect. The Conservative-led Scottish Borders Council does not manage housing stock. It is managed by the Register Social uh, Landlords, and this underspend of eight million reflected a number of development challenges that, that those particular registered social uh, housing landlords had. Thank you, presiding officer. Thank you. Um, the member will be aware that points of order should be used to inquire as to whether proper parliamentary procedures are being or have been followed. Um, the content of members' contributions and the accuracy thereof are a, mem are a matter for members, and members will know that a mechanism exists for correction where that is required. That concludes the debate on Programme for Government 2024 to 2025, and we'll now move on to the next item of business, which is consideration of business motion 14305 in the name of Jamie Hepburn on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a business programme. And I call on the Minister to move the motion. Move, Presiding Officer. Thank you. No member has asked to speak to the motion. Therefore, the question is that motion 14305 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 14306 in the name of Jamie Hepburn on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau on a stage two timetable. Any member who wishes to speak to the motion should press their request to speak button. And I call on Jamie Hepburn to move the motion. Move, presiding officer. Thank you, Minister. No member has asked to speak to the motion, therefore. The question is that motion 14306 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed. The next item of business is consideration of three Parliamentary Bureau motions. And I ask Jamie Hepburn, on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, to move motions 14307 on approval of an SSI, 14308 on committee membership, and 14309 on Office of the Clerk. Move, President Officer. Thank you, Minister. And the question on these motions will be put at decision time, and there's one question to be put as a result of today's business. I propose to ask a single question on three parliamentary bureau motions. Does any member object? No. The question, therefore, is that motions 14307 on approval of an SSI, 14308 on committee membership, and 14309 on Office of the Clerk in the name of Jamie Hepburn on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motions are therefore agreed. And that concludes decision time and we'll now move on to members' business in the name of Bob Doris. Be grateful if those leaving the chamber could do so quietly.